Good afternoon, folks. Welcome to The Daily Politics. The last Labour government got it wrong on immigration, says Ed Miliband. But what in practical terms would he do about it if he ever came to power? The row about Jimmy Carr's tax affairs is still deafening practically everyone here at Westminster. The kind of satirists survive a dose of his own medicine. Nick Clegg's still in Rio. There's a big Earth Summit going on there. But have the claims of the environment effectively been mugged by grim economic reality? And have social media sites given political voice to these young mums in the Midlands? All that in the next hour. With us for the duration, the independent newspaper columnist, chairman of the Social Market Foundation think tank. She was actually on this week with me last night as well. She doesn't sleep like me, Marianne Siegert. And the titan of the mail on Sunday. At least that's what it says here. He gave me a tenor if I said I would say it. Peter Hitchens, welcome to you too. First, the banks still in the news, as they are almost every day these days. Late last night, one of these international ratings agencies, Moody's, downgraded a whole range of banks, including British banks such as Barclays, HSBC and the Royal Bank of Scotland. Now, this matters because the ratings these banks get can influence how much it costs them to borrow on what's called the wholesale markets. That's where they borrow from each other. And if they have to pay more then they'll certainly pass these extra costs on to their customers when these customers come to borrow from the banks. These customers, of course, are you and me. I guess this was inevitable, and it's not a huge deal, is it? Well, it was inevitable. We've been expecting it for months now, and as banks in the Eurozone get more and more dodgy, British banks' exposure to those banks uh, you know, becomes more of a worry for us. We're not very exposed to Greek banks, but we are to Spanish and Italian ones. Yes. And, yes, we have been expecting it. But it does make a difference. As you say, it makes a difference to you and me. It sounds very abstract, but actually if they're having to pay more for their money when they want to borrow money, then when they lend it on to us, they're going to charge us more. And, and we've lent to French and German banks who are exposed to the club Absolutely, club-led and you countries. get a bit of a, a, a domino. Yeah. It's the reason... I mean, people wonder why you know, the official base rate is 0.5%. Yeah. But you're never going to get a loan for anything like that. And that's because the money that the banks are paying themselves is rising and rising because of uncertainty in the market. Yes, but I can't see really what the point of these ratings agencies is. They failed, as far as I can see, to predict or warn against the crash itself. And now they seem to be scrabbling around trying to make out that they know what's going on <laughs> and doing harm in the process. Who will, who will, be, who will benefit from this sort of thing? I, I just wish but, they'd shut up. But, it's, but they're not inaccurate to downgrade, are they? I mean, no, no I, I think they're right to downgrade. And, and, yes, they did fail before the credit crunch, but, nonetheless, we've got nothing to put in their place. And you do need... Investors need some form of ranking the bonds that they want to buy. And, you know, if you're a pension fund and you're only allowed to invest, say, in AAA bonds, that means bonds where the borrower is guaranteed to pay you which back. Which often by law you have it, to do. Which often by law you have to do. Then you need to know what the credit worthiness is of, of, of the borrower. You know, you can't the, just do away with credit agencies. The, the, but are, the, are these people a reliable, objective source of information? So, or are they, as they say, just trying to overcompensate tend, for their past failure? They tend to follow... They, they don't actually make the market. They tend to follow yeah, the market. They're catching... They're, this ratings agency is now catching up with what most people have already known. The wider picture, Peter, which just seems incapable of resolution unless miracles happen and something changes at the EU summit, another <clears throat> summit next week after the G20, um, it, is that it just seems that the inability to sort the Eurozone is now a constant drag on the world economy, including the British economy. You do begin to wonder, don't you, if this isn't comparable to the months before Britain pulled out of the ERM, when everybody said, well, if we leave the ERM, it will be a complete disaster. And, in fact, it wasn't. That the end of the Eurozone and, in fact, the end of the single currency itself can't really come soon enough for the sake of... You would just want the economy. currency to go well, I, 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 Since the whole thing, it seemed to me from the start, and I'm one of the people who can claim from the very beginning to have been against it on perfectly sound economic and political grounds, since the whole thing from the start was wrong, uh, why mightn't it be possible that getting rid of it and moving out of it will actually be the stimulant that the European economies need? Well, if we're going to get into competitive opposition here, <laughs> I was also against it from the start, and I was Where actually involved in the No campaign. I, I was on the steering committee just because I felt so strongly about the economics of it, and I, I could see it was bound to go wrong in the end. But I remember at the has. time what 
People who were against it said that if you include all these countries, it's not what economists call an optimal currency it area. Nothing like one. And, yes. and, and that, of course, has been proven to... I mean, yeah. It turns out in the J.P. Morgan study that countries beginning with the name M in the UN are more of an optimal currency area <laughs> than the Eurozone. But people also said, from your side of argument, you could have one if it was confined to Germany, the Benelux countries, Scandinavia, maybe France. Possibly. It could retrench Possibly. to that, couldn't yes, it? Yes, but you still need to have comp you know, pretty strong political and, and fiscal union mm. even to make that work. And okay. so, you know, you've got to persuade German voters that they should subsidise the poorer parts of um, France, say. Forever. Uh, forever. And, forever. you know, they don't have the same sort of communality, the communality that, mm. you know, we in the South East have with people in the North East. The so. problem with it is that Germany is actually benefiting from the euro because it's effectively a substantial devaluation of the Deutschmark, which yes. enables Germany it's to had no export to the Far East. And that's that's why they cling on to it okay. uh, under any other circumstances and okay. they want to get out of it. We will uh, have a chance to come back to that next week, so we'll move on for the moment. It's time for our daily quiz. Britain's in trouble with Brussels again. <gasps> Horror. So our question for today is, why is the European Commission taking Britain to court this time? Is it A, failure to manufacture Cornish pasties in Cornwall, too much bacteria in British cheese, the price of strawberries at Wimbledon, or failure to pay enough tax on imports of garlic? Ah, difficult questions, eh? More tough than guess the year. Anyway, at the end of the show, Mary Ann and Peter will have a wild stab at the answer. Don't tell me now, do you have any idea? I do, actually. I know. Ah. Ah, sorry. <laughs> That's what happens when you have bright people on the programme. Politicians don't often admit they got it wrong, so when they do, it's usually pretty big news. Today, Ed Miliband says Labour, quote, got it wrong on the issue of immigration when in government. And he said that voters who raise concerns about immigration aren't bigots after all. Who would have thunk it? You remember in 2010, Gordon Brown famously described Gillian Duffy, the now famous pensioner from Rochdale, as a bigot after she raised the issue of immigration with him. So what's the background to this? Well, under Labour, immigration soared. Official figures show that net migration between 1997 and 2010 was 2.5 million. That's the official figure. Unofficial could be bigger. The coalition is committed to bringing immigration down to the tens of thousands. They're nowhere near that yet. The latest figures show that in the first year of the coalition government, net migration was, you got it, still 250,000. The vast number of those 242,000 in the net figure came to the UK to study. Now, Ed Miliband's ideas include keeping in place transitional controls on migration for new e EU countries, such as Croatia. Labour didn't do that when in power. A crackdown on recruitment agencies that advertise solely for immigrant workers. You'd think that would be illegal. And an early warning system if some industries are employing disproportionately large numbers of foreign workers. That'll be interesting to monitor. And more action, such as heavier fines on those employers who undercut the minimum wage. Here's what Ed Miliband had to say this morning. Why didn't we listen more? I think at least by the end of our time in office, we were too dazzled, too sanguine about globalisation, too sanguine about the impact of globalisation and indeed migration on economic growth. We lost sight of who was benefiting from that, gro from that growth, whose living standards were being squeezed. And to those who lost out, we were too quick to say, like it or lump it. The truth is the public were ahead of us in seeing some of the problems of migration because they were seeing them in their own communities. With us now, the Shadow Immigration Minister, Chris Bryant. Welcome back to the programme. Good morning. Uh, Afternoon, sorry. When did you realise, first realise, Labour had got it wrong? Well, I remember when Gillian Duffy, when that whole thing happened in the general election, I thought, you know what, Gillian Duffy looks, I mean, I've never spoken to her, but she looked remarkably like an awful lot of my constituents in the Ronda, who've had concerns about immigration for a long time, uh, and, uh, and in particular, who would come to me and say, um, you know, my son has just got a job in Gloucester, um, it's great, but after five weeks, suddenly the employers decided to get rid of all the British workers and bring in some contractor, contractees from Poland and, and undercut their wages. And, and that's certainly when it came, hit, hit home to so, me. And that's why 
ever since I've had this job, which is the job I, I asked for. Um, I've, been, I've been saying that I think that it's really important that we got two things wrong when we were in government. First of all, that we, we, we went it alone, as it were. We and Ireland were the only countries in Europe when the other new countries came in who decided that anybody could come and work here in the UK from the day one of their joining the European Union. That was a mistake. Everybody came here but far you were warned at the time by many people not to do it. Yes, and we got it wrong. And I think that that's partly, as Ed said in his speech, that we were, in a sense, sort of bedazzled by... Um, uh, you know, the, the global economy, and we wanted to be able to do well in it. And, and, and Ed, again, was right. You know, if you wanted to have a, um, a conservatory built on your house, it was good for you because it probably meant that it was cheaper, but it wasn't so good if you were the kind of person who worked in a company that built conservatories. What was the second thing you got wrong? Uh, the second thing was that I, I, it was, we, we left it far too late before we introduced a points-based system, which would have meant that people coming into this country were only the people who could actively contribute to, um, mm. to, to society. And I think that that meant, in particular for um, a lot of British people, including people who came to this country maybe 20 years ago or whose parents came uh, 30 years ago, uh, it meant if they were close to... Um, the national minimum wage, then their wages were undercut. But when the Tories, uh, Michael Howard, proposed the points-based system uh, in the 2005 election, Labour excoriated him. Uh, yeah, we got it wrong, and, and I think we yeah, should have... It's quite a big mistake. It is a big mistake, and that's why we're, we're saying, you know, that's why Ed Miliband, this I'm sure will not be the last speech he's going to make about immigration, but the first, I hope, of a, of a, a continued so, dialogue, because there's, there, I think it's always been a mistake to see immigration just standing on its own. For many people, it's also about the welfare system, sure, no, I understand. it's about housing, it's about but, public services, but, and it's about the economy. If you got it wrong on those two things, does that mean, if you add up all these mistakes, that there are too many foreigners in Britain? It stands to logic, doesn't it, that, that if I'm saying that we should have introduced proper curbs um, when the new countries joined the European Union and that we uh, should have introduced a points-based system, that I'm, I am, of course, saying, and Ed himself did this morning, um, that too many people came in when we were in power. What do you make of this, Mayor Cooper? I think it's probably sensible. I mean, they've obviously been looking at the opinion polls. They do well, their own a, focus It's opinion poll-driven politics. And they politics. know the two... The two main reasons why Labour voters des deserted the Labour Party at the last election were immigration and welfare. And as Chris says, the two of them are often combined. And therefore, it's pr probably Labour have got to do this in order to get themselves re-elected. And can I just say, Andrew, that I wrote a, a pamphlet about this immediately after the general election because I felt very strongly about it, that it was in particular in areas like mine, in areas like the Ronda, it's not about opinion polls. Frankly, you don't need to have a pollster to tell you any, any of this. All you had to do was knock a lot of doors. Um, and, and it was one of the issues that came back time and time again. That's not to say that places like the Ronda, which in the 1860s grew on the back of immigration from Italy and England and Ireland and so on, on, um, don't recognise that being welcoming foreigners is a good, strong British principle. But that it has you, happened well, very fast, and it, <clears throat> and it has changed the nature and the numbers of, a lot were of these huge. communities. Let, yeah. um, you, I suspect, Peter, will hear the sound of the barn door closing as the horse has bolted. Oh well, evidently, but you hear that all the time. The thing that I, f I find most objectionable about this is that having been showered with buckets of slime and hosed down with abuse by people on the left for saying exactly this for 15 years. I now have to sit here and watch these people try and get political credit for discovering that people like me were right all along, the people whom they slimed and smeared. The Labour Party is a party of bourgeois, bohemian, metropolitan trendies, which <laughs> loves having servants, cheap, uh, cheap restaurants, cheap waiters, and all the things that they benefit from in the, in the, in the, in the fat lives they, they, they lead in the capital. But it also relies on the votes of people who, who actually don't benefit from immigration. And it's discovered that if it's going to survive and if it's going to get back into office, it's going to have to grovel to them. It doesn't make any difference. The damage is already done. And also, you haven't admitted the other thing, which your, your former speechwriter, or rather New Labour's former speechwriter, Andrew Nether, admitted in the Evening Standard some years ago, which is that this was a deliberate policy to transform the country. And you meant it to be so. Well, then, you, you've, you've, you've done it. You've, you've done it you've now. There's, a there's, of there's no uh, point saying, no, "Oh, we're sorry." Now we did no, that. You're not sorry at all. What no, you're sorry well, about is it's cost you. I don't know where you start reacting to that, but it's over to you. <laughs> over to you. <laughs> well, I know "bucket of slime" is, 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 is one of Peter's absolute favourite um, phrases because he used it about six times on Question Time two weeks ago. But, well, that's, but that's, that was because your Charlie Attorney General has just chipped one over me. It's a bit of an irony, isn't it, when the when somebody who writes for the Mail starts complaining about buckets of slime being poured over anybody. But look, let's, this is a serious issue, and there's no point in uh, argy-bargy on it. it. It is absolutely true 
that um, that many migrants to this country have dramatically assisted our economy. They've, they've become major employers, they've, become, they've been entrepreneurs, they've won Nobel Prizes so what's your and problem? all the rest of it. So, so what we wanted, what we should have been doing is making sure that the people who could really add value to this country came into this country and, and, and not everybody else. Now, but, 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 but if the, you look at the health service as well, you know, there are many migrants sure, who Sure, but you seem service. to want to have your do cake and eat it. You, I do. You want to say that yes. immigrants are wonderful. And, I mean, you're like Boris Johnson, you're in favour of cake and in favour of eating it. Uh, which which is a What's general policy. Or, 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 well, you look at it and then you think, if I don't eat that, I'll be healthier. But you seem to want to say immigrants are wonderful, but we've got too many of them. I mean, that is just surely an Ill uh, illogical. No, because I think you ought to be drawing a distinction. So, for instance, um, I don't think it's a great idea if we have mass migration of lots of people who have no skills into this country, but I think it's a good thing if you have British universities having lots of uh, foreign students coming to this country, uh, studying, uh, going back to their own country, but, and then having a strong, but, uh, you know, a desire have, to do trade with our country. But if yeah. I have what you said earlier right, you accepted when Andrew asked you whether there were too many people in the country, you accepted that there were. I'm not, I, I'm not saying that there are too many people in the country Oh, you're now. not saying I, that now. No, no I, I, what I said was... So foreign that, people in the no, country. No, what yeah. I, I was asked a specific question, which was, it, during the period that we're talking about, did we get it wrong and were, did too many people come into this country? Yes. And I'm saying is, look, we have already said that, first of all, we should have had proper restraints on the number of people coming in um, from no, the... No, you're backing away from that now, because you, you, no, you, you clearly... You clearly I'm still saying that, but I'm not saying that there the are point. too many people in this country... I think you're backing away from it. ...and that we should have a cull Because you know what... What's coming next, don't you? If there are too many foreign people in this country, what are you going to do about it? Well, I think there are things that we... It, I'm not saying that there are too many foreign people in this well, country. Not. Well, you did earlier. No, I yes, didn't. Did. I said... I think did in the answer to... the logic is. No, no, I said that too many people... Too, there were too many migrants came in a short period of time um, into okay. this country and, and right. we should have done... And they're still here, obviously. It, Let yes. me ask you well, this, no, looking for... No, they're not all here. Well, they're not all here. Well, according to the ONS, the population of Britain has risen by 3 million because of uh, labour and, migration policy. And, and, that's, that's a lot of people, three and, million. And, Andrew... Um, an maybe good, lot, maybe an, bad, a lot, but a lot, a lot. Of, a lot of the migrants who come to this country every year, which the government includes in its statistics, are um, students who come to do three-year courses, more than a one-year course. Right. I think that that is good for okay. the British economy because we need to have right. world-standard so, okay, universities right, but, the world, but if you, and those people okay. all go back. Well, okay, okay, okay. some, well, they don't all go back, the actually. majority go back. Well, some but, people come here... But it is a way into this country as well. No, some people and uh, there, there are no rights guaranteed well, let me ask you, in, in let's terms move of staying forward to the future. But some people do come to train right, as a doctor in this no, country, and no, then I want to know what you're going to do about it because you've done the Mayor Cooper. We got this wrong. We got that wrong. In some ways, that's quite refreshing. But I can't see anything you're proposing will really make a difference except on the margins to the numbers coming in. You still oppose a cap on immigration, right? We're quite happy to. Well, there isn't a cap now. Uh, there's a cap no, on you, a, there's a, you oppose a cap? there's a cap on a single on three percent of the total number of people coming into this country every year. There's about a half a million people coming into this country, and there's a cap on twenty thousand. And, uh, you, and, and you oppose any controls on student visas too? On any? Uh, yeah. I mean, no. if you're a student, get a visa, you get in. You could, there's no cap on that either. No, we, we think the government was absolutely right to say that we would tackle the issue of um, fake colleges, and, and that's another do, thing, frankly, which we should have okay. done when no, no, we were I, in office. And so do you think um, the but, government is right to... It's shown no success in doing it so far, but, of course, it's early days. Do you think the government is right to be aiming to get net migration down to the tens of thousands rather than the hundreds. I don't think it stands a chance of doing it. Um, and my concern yeah. about the particular target that they've set themselves of a of a net migration, which is the difference between those coming in mm. and, and, and those going out, is the, the best way of dealing with it is trying to persuade lots of people to leave the country if you want to meet that target. Sure. Actually, there's a danger that you will do things that could potentially be very damaging for the economy. But what the bit that I think that has always been left out of this argument by people like uh, people Peter and, uh, and uh, those on uh, the right of British politics is the element about what it does to local workforces. And, and, and that's the bit where uh, I think there is far more we can do about making sure, for instance, that you can't just say everybody who, who, who we want to employ in this company, um, even though it's a company that serves um, Morrison or Asda or whatever, has got to be able to speak Polish. Um, uh, it would be good if they, they were all required to speak English. Uh, there are things you can do around making sure
sure that the national minimum wage is properly enforced because a lot of people, and we heard more stories this morning from but, those who were there for Ed's speech. Of course, I understand whenever, all that. Whenever you hear the word crackdown, uh, then you know that it's a phony. Crackdown means nothing, nothing will happen. It's not that you well, want... We can't it's not, well, set no, about if a you were, if we're not the government. No, if, you were in the office, if, if you were in office, you, you wouldn't either. It would just be another of those eye-catching policies with which the Prime Minister could be personally associated and nothing would happen. It's not that you want to have your cake and eat it, it's that you want to have the votes of people whose opinions you secretly despise. OK. But I, I, don't, I don't know. No, no. I, 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 sorry. The, the, the bit I completely object about that. I, I, my constituents have been expressing these views to me. I have put them very clearly, and I think it's right okay. that, we, that, we do, that, we, uh, that we have policies at the next general election that address these issues. Okay. Wanting to... Which will want, to nothing what, what, in practice. Well, uh, your, well, we'll, cynicism, we'll your cynicism is a beauty to behold. It's not cynicism, well, it's experience. It's come, cynicism, come back, a beauty to behold. Come back because I think the big challenge for you now, and I think you will agree, is to come up with policies that will convince people. That Absolutely, make a this can so only be the first that, of uh, first part let's of the put stage. Put that for another day, Chris Bryant. Thank I'm you. I'm coming being back. You'll be you. back. Now you might use your mobile phone to pay your bills, catch up on last night's TV, especially this week, or more likely make sure you've taped a whole week's worth of the daily and the Sunday politics programmes because we know you don't get out a lot. But have you ever used it to organise a political campaign, save a local hospital or plant trees in a park? Well, it seems that some people, including many who never thought they had a scintilla of interest in politics, they're doing just that. We sent Kate Conway to Nottingham to meet some. Women used to talk politics here, on the stoop, hanging out the washing, over the fence. And it's tempting to think that all of that has disappeared. But here in Retford, working class women are doing garden wall politics, but they're doing it online. They're doing it on their mobile phone and they're changing the way local services are run. So when Adele Mumby found out that there were plans to change the local maternity unit, she decided to do something about it. We're having six children and being a mother and being, you know, understanding what it meant and implications that that had. I just, it just uh, got to me and I thought, right, we've got to do something about this. I contacted a local councillor, Graham Oxby, and I contacted John Mann and said, I've got, I've got some information, I need more information, but that wasn't enough, I wanted to do more. My um, ten-year-old daughter actually set it up because I had no idea how to use Facebook or a phone or anything like that, and uh, Kyra set it up, and uh, within, I think, was it ten minutes, there were 32 members within an hour. It grew and grew and grew. And so from text messages and Facebook, a campaign was born. And the local Labour MP, John Mann, says it's those very tools, that social media, that's created a new type of voter. If they're, they're not engaged with politics, or they haven't been. Here, we're suddenly finding the non-voters, the non-engaged, the so-called alleged apathetics, right in the middle of big politics, serious politics, changing things. Um, I got two tonne of uh, soil delivered free of charge, uh, railway sleepers, um, got health and safety down here. The teenage lads that wanted it designed it and they all built it. And as you can see, it's uh, spot on. And while the government may be planning a new force of 5,000 community organisers around the country, Lorna tells me she doesn't think they need outside help. A community buzzword there is, is something that might interest people, but at the same time, you know, we are doing it ourselves. We don't need somebody to be told you're in charge of this community. We are the community. And they're not taking their cue from politicians. It's the other way round. Would you ever read the tweets of John Mann or any other MP for that matter? No, I don't read tweets. Never. Which doesn't surprise this expert in political communications. It's actually about having an ongoing dialogue with our community as opposed to just blasting out a press release. So it's using these tools to, to find issues that people in their local community care about and then work out a way in which they as a politician and a leader in their community can actually make a change in the community as a consequence of that information. And for the Labour MP John Mann, it's another way of winning. If we get those people partnering with us, then we win an election. We we'll win an election by a significant majority were back in power and if we trust those people and we transfer some real power to them on their agendas on their priorities on their terms then i think we could be in power for a long time and bozier he used to be labor's e-campaigns manager when tony blair was prime minister 
More recently, he's come out for the Tories. He's busy launching a new social media platform as a kind of rival to Twitter. Let, let's start with a, a general question. Has Twitter and these other social media sites, have they had a positive or a negative effect on politics? Absolutely positive. Um, I think it used to be the case that politicians existed within a little bit of a vacuum and the only voices, the only time they would hear the voices of the people they seek to represent or they claim to represent was when they were back in their constituencies uh, and a politician could only see a few handfuls of people every week. Twitter and Facebook, if a politician uh, is wired into those networks, they get instant feedback. Um, the work that they do, the things that they say, they instantly get opinions back from the public. And I think that is that has a massive impact on politics. It's It's been a benefit to our democracy, Peter. Well, maybe it has. I don't know. It seems to me the old-fashioned methods work just as well. Uh, a few months ago in my hometown of, of, of Oxford, we had a campaign to save the public libraries, uh, which used all kinds of old-fashioned things, like people ringing each other up, uh, the newspapers getting involved, and a fantastic, thrilling public meeting addressed by Philip Pullman. And in the end of, the end of it, we saved the public libraries. I don't remember a single tweet uh, or a single Facebook page on the whole thing. So you're still old, old, old fashioned you? politics. Were you looking there? Are you on Twitter? I tr I, no, I'm not. On, I'm not. I, I am on, I am on, I, 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 I am on Facebook. There's a Peter Hitchens must die uh, site on Facebook. Oh, we're all on that. <laughs> we don't worry. I'm not sure you've got to join the century. But what, because actually, I, 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 and journalism are changing hugely. And if you're not part of it, I, don't, I really don't see why, 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 why you have to restrict yourself to 27 words, or whatever it is, uh, to, to say something. I can't see the point of, of, of Twitter it's or, I think it's or, or Facebook myself. Other people, are welcome, other people are welcome to them, but they don't, they're no substitute, uh, nor, nor, no, particu nor, particu nor particularly the, better. The, the, than, I yes. think the bifurcation... Yeah, dealing there directly with human being our guests back in. The, the, the bifurcation, I think, is false and unnecessary. I think you need both. You, um, Twitter's one tool, uh, and it gives a lot of people a voice, which is important. Facebook's good for organising. Email is very good for campaigning and fundraising. But you also need the real stuff as well. And where we've seen digital really impact elections, for example, in 2008 with Obama, is where they use digital with the real world stuff. So they use the internet to get people to go out and knock on doors, for example. And that, that's, that's really positive. Well, they use the internet to raise money. They did. And they they raised raise the millions yes. of dollars. And, it, and it's good for that. Uh, of very small donations. Yeah. It's all, you know, we talk a lot about how the 24 hour news channels have changed the news cycle. But Twitter's changed the news cycle even more, hasn't it? It's oh, speeded hugely. it up even more. Yeah, and I rely on Twitter for my news feed now. Mm. I don't have to go to the you know, BBC News mm. website or in the past to PA to see what's going on. I just look on Twitter and it's fantastic and it's much more than 140 characters because what people do is they link to a much more interesting web page. Yes. But it's just so a left-wing electronic mob. It's not left-wing. It I think it's part of I think it's, it's, it's blind. It's overwhelmingly left-wing. How left do you know you don't even use because, it? Because I'm abused on it. I'm probably being abused on it. We're all abused on it. People on the left are abused on it. There was an interesting development. The mob surging back It has as many views as the people who use it. There was an interesting development during the budget, which was that even before the Chancellor sat down, hashtag granny tax had come up and and pasty pasty tax and then well, pasty yes. and yes. and suddenly it runs yes. it so does it's that instant have, feedback whereas the politicians themselves are not that great at using it i mean more than half of mps have twitter but if That's you take so at the end of the england ukraine uh, match ed Miliband, or obviously someone else who writes it for him says great result for england credit to all the players I mean, does that make him so seem... Banal, could I, really I, more, him I'm, sure the, I'm sure the England team were, were over that, the moon. Yeah. I mean, William Higgs tweets are pretty pathetic they're pretty as well. Dull. But yeah. they're not all. Some MPs are great on, on Twitter. You know, they, they yeah, really get in there the and get... Like, Tom Watson, Chris Bryant, who was just on My Business Stella Partner, Creasy. Louise Mensch, Mensch, Stella Creasy. Absolutely. You, you may not be on it, Peter, but your newspaper increasingly runs stories based on quotes from Twitter. Oh, sure, Whether yeah. it's John Collins complaining about you can't get in because the border agency is <laughs> too inefficient. I, I just stopped or... at blogging. I thought blogging seemed to me to be perfectly sensible, but, but, but Twitter was a step too far. I think you have to look at the electronic revolution and select the bits of it that work for you. I Hopefully you, you'll I think find Twitter, a place. Twitter will be a, well, Facebook, I think, is already fading. I think Twitter will probably yeah. be forgotten in five years. Mention.com is, is the new one, Peter, and I hope we can... We can welcome you on there. What's, you, what's the difference between your website and Twitter? Well, I think it's, it's a niche complement to Twitter. It, it's a separate community, but it's for people who are interested in specific topics. And at the moment, that, that is all about politics. You get 180 um, characters in your... 180 characters, yeah. Um, but maybe you'll be able to sign up, uh, Peter. Exactly, so you can, you can say He's say a longer, you can, he can write tightly. <laughs> you, Twitter's a great discipline for it trying is, to it? get things down concisely. It is. The other difference with mention 
which we mentioned in Twitter, is you don't have to work for weeks to build up a follower list. You, you, okay. Once you join, you've got your followers and right. you focus on the topics that, that interest okay. you. Okay. Look, thank you for being with us. Thank it's you. Good to see you. Thank you. Now, the first, first Earth Summit in 20 years has been taking place in Rio this week and ends today. The aim of the summit is to agree sustainable development goals with targets for consumption and production. Earlier in the week, the Prince of Wales warned the gathering via the internet, he didn't go himself, of the danger of inaction on climate change. We are facing challenges that are increasing rather than diminishing in their severity and urgency. Now, I have watched in despair at how slow progress has sometimes been and how the outright sceptical reluctance by some to engage with the critical issues of our day have often slowed that progress to a standstill. Now, the Prime Minister dispatched his Liberal Democrat deputy to the diplomatic jungle. There he is, wandering through it, looking for Michael Gove. He was pessimistic about the chances of success. When you're dealing with over 190 countries around the negotiating table, you've got a problem, which is to get everyone to agree, you, you end up sort of diluting things so that everybody agrees and the, and the end result is more insipid than you'd like. So has the impetus to tackle climate change been lost in the misery of global economic downturn? Andrew Pendleton is head of campaigns at Friends of the Earth. James Dellingpole is the author of a book called Watermelons, How Environmentalists Are Killing the Earth. So I think we know where he stands. Right, let me come to Friends of the Earth first. I mean, isn't the, the harsh reality, the undeniable truth, is that apart from Prince Charles, in an age of uh, austerity and uncertainty, People just care less about the environment and more about where the jobs are coming from. I don't think that's true. I mean, it won't surprise me. It surprise you to hear me say that. But I, I don't think that's the case. I think poll after poll shows that in the centre ground of politics, there's still a, a lot of concern, almost as much as there was. It's waned a little bit, but it, there is still as much. Mr. Of a Mr. Obama and Mr. Cameron couldn't be bothered to go to Rio. I, I, they only I, sent Mr. Clegg. I think. I think the problem for Mr. Cameron in particular is that there's a drag out to the right and the Conservative Party which is where this debate's getting caught up at the moment. And that means that it's going to be difficult for him because actually this is an important issue in the centre ground. Um, and yet if he's pulled out to the right on the issue uh, by fears of losing voters to UKIP, for instance, then, um, then that will help by Mr. degrees Obama to make him less... He's running for election. If he thought this mattered in the November election, he would have gone. He clearly didn't. He didn't go. It's very polarised in the US. In the UK, the really fascinating thing is that while our economy broadly has flatlined, um, the green sectors within that economy, including energy, but also recycling, waste disposal and so forth, have all grown by around about 5%. So they are right. trend-bucking sectors of the economy. So uh, just because the economy is doing badly is not a reason to turn our backs on saving the planet, is it? Well, I'm very sorry that you had to invoke the dread subject of green jobs, because what green jobs do is kill jobs in the real economy. Green jobs only exist because of taxpayer subsidy. We see this in the wind farm industry, which are, which are onshore wind farms operate on a 100% subsidy from the taxpayer. Offshore wind farms operate on a 200% um, subsidy. These are not real jobs. It's, it's all a fantasy. And I think that it, it is time that we judge the environmental movement on what it has actually achieved. And what it has done to the world is, is really quite serious harm. We've seen rainforests chopped down to grow palm oil to create biofuels. We've had agricultural land being diverted to biofuels, again, causing starvation, poverty in the third world. We've got wind farms blighting, blighting the landscape, chopping up birds, killing bats. The environmental movement has also damaged the global economy with its All right. insane quest for okay. renewables. I'll let you come back. Well, globally, over the last three years, more investment money has gone into renewable technologies than into uh, conventional energy sources. So I, I don't think a lot of investors share your view, James. And I think most the real... of a lot of that's government money or subsidised money. No, no, no. That's, a lot of that's from the private sector. So there is... Yeah, but it's subsidised. There's a subsidy in the system for mm. most of the renewable technologies. That's coming down quite dramatically as costs, for instance, in solar globally fall by 75% in the past five years. So there re really is promise. And investors 
wholeheartedly disagree. The tragedy of the current situation in the UK is that blowing hot and cold, flip-flopping on green, which is what the coalition is doing, is killing investor confidence. Yeah. And that I means mean, people will not put money into our economy. But, I, I mean, a few years ago, David Cameron, he was pictured with huskies. He was talking about starting a wind turbine in Downing Street. That, of course, never happened. The greenest government ever. Uh, so. Now he doesn't even go to the Rio side. I mean, you, you, it well, cannot be he, denied that priorities have changed. Yeah. No, you're right. Over he could have gone. He was in Mexico. Well, it's he could have gone down. He, he was actually at the G. I mean, they were clashing, weren't they? Well, the they overlapped the, only a little bit. Summit. He could still have been there. Yeah. Mr. Clegg's still there. This Mexican summit's over. Yeah. No, I mean, I don't think he's made... Correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think he's made a speech on the environment since he's become Prime Minister. No. And I do think they have a feeling that... Being green is a luxury that you can afford during good times and it's something that people can't afford during bad times. I think that's what voters feel. I mean, Nick Clegg goes halfway around the world to this summit, but he's only quoted on his reaction to um, Michael Gove's plans for all levels. It's what was interesting about this summit was how little time the BBC, which has been taken over by warmest fanatics, uh, has devoted has, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Has, has, yeah, yeah. Has, has, has devoted to it. Well, it, it, it's, it's observably true. The BBC doesn't even believe it, it has any business to be impartial on the That's subject. why we have and James on, I and guess. it says yeah. so. Yeah, why do you think uh, but, I'm but, the exception that proves the rule. Uh, with, uh, having people on... And you, having, pe matter. You having people you on... We've as, got as, you as, on, as, too. As, 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 as I'm evidence, is not the same as having a general a general bias in favour of certain things, which the BBC does, but it hasn't, bo hasn't bothered with I, this because the cult is visibly dying. Well, I want Pe to... Very or, fewer and fewer people believe in the, in, I, in, in, in the, in, in, in the science of, of man-made global warming. And it's how they're going to get out of it is, is, is what amuses me, when it's eventually become so obvious that the thing was a, was a well, cult well, and a scam in the first place. There's a, there's a how will they actually get out of all the Well, there's a fact here which actually relevant James Lovelock can always reverse to, himself. If you would shut up for a minute. I'd oh, hang on a minute. <laughs> Uh, and that is that, keep that, quiet. that well, you have for the next two minutes. Right. Uh, there is evidence that people don't worry about it so much. I'm talking about global warming. They don't worry about it so much. They don't think it's as important. They think a lot of scare stories was, were told. Now, one of the facts, and I'll put it like that to find out if it's true, is that people like James say that actually temperatures haven't risen in this century. And so we're right not to be worried about it so much. What say you? 1998 is the base year for that statement. 1998 is statistically an outlier year. It was just a huge bulge. And if you look at the trend, which any serious statistician will do over time, it's consistently up. Some of the warmest years on record have been in the last decade. But has it so... been... Have temperatures continued to rise... Yeah. Uh, in this century. Yeah, in fact, NASA puts 2005 in its data above 1998. Okay. So, so we're seeing consistent... Phil Jones of the Climatic Research Unit, who could, you could not get more warmest than that man, has said there has been no statistically significant warming trend since 1995. If it has increased at all, it's so tiny as to make no difference. Well, I'll, and it's, I'll, I'll and send it's interesting. You, um, I'll send you the graph that, later. Uh, this the, this the, fact the point, matters, doesn't it? I, well, if people feel temperatures are not rising, they're not likely to follow the green agenda when it comes to global warming. Do you know, I saw a very interesting poll yesterday, which was conducted by Ipsos Mori, a reputable institution, earlier this year. And do you know who people trust most on this issue? They trust the scientists. 66% of people trust the scientists. Only 9% yeah. trust scientists journalists like, on what, the like issue. Like Richard Lindzen, for example, the professor of atmospheric well, physics well, that's, that's at the uh, one MIT. Scientist Real you, scientists. Can, or Fred but Singer. This, but you know, most of the people who talk on this subject, on both sides, are not scientists. Even, even on the global warming side, they're mainly lobbyists. They're not scientists. The yeah. vast majority of... Are you a scientist? The, I'm not a scientist. The vast majority case of my physicists... Case rest. Well, yeah. <laughs> but if, if I can finish, Andrew. Of course. Um, the vast majority of physicists, of proper atmospheric scientists, um, are not only say global warming is happening and that it's related to human activity, but that it's getting... It's accelerating, surely, it's getting surely, worse. Even, yeah. even if yes. global warming isn't happening, and I'm not a scientist and therefore I'm not going to opine on this, surely it makes sense to use more sources of energy that aren't going to run out and fewer sources of energy that are going to run out. And oil and coal will eventually run out. The sun isn't going to stop shining. So I don't really see what the problem is in using more renewables. Well, one small point about scientists. Scientific questions are not decided by majorities. Uh, they're decided by experiment and, and a successful prediction and, and things like that. And a majority can, can easily be wrong among scientists. So to cite that is, is 
meaningless in scientific terms, as you ought to know. But secondly, there is a very major energy crisis in this country. In a few years' time, thanks to European Union regulation and other things, we simply will not have enough electricity to run the sort of economy we have, particularly the very heavily electronics-dependent economy we've become. Mm -hmm. We're doing nothing about it. There's an urgent need to provide reliable power. And wind power and solar power will not cannot do it. And the, one of the things that, and sometimes one can laugh at the warmest movement, but on, on this matter, you can't laugh at it. It's very, it no, very okay. serious indeed. They are preventing right. serious we, consideration. Right. Whereas we do have shale gas. gas. We have right. loads of shale gas. OK, and we will do another debate on shale another day. We've uh, run out of time. I'd just like to say before you go, if, could, if you could both blog on this issue of what's been happening to temperatures over the past 15 years. If we could take your blogs and put them then on the Daily Politics website, let's get a debate going and trying to establish it, because I do think it's one of the key issues that is determining people's attitudes. I'd be delighted to do Thank that. You. Thank you both. Now, earlier this week, uh, we all thought that K2 was just the second highest mountain on Earth. It still is. But since then, we've discovered that it's not a vast pile of rocks in the Himalayas alone. It's Jimmy Carr's money in Jersey. Apparently, it's a kind of investment trust which uh, allowed the comedian to avoid the kind of income tax the rest of us get lumbered with. Where was my accountant when I needed him? David Cameron described this perfectly legal behaviour as, quote, morally unacceptable. And yesterday, Mr Carr did the fastest climb down in K2's history. He pulled out of the scheme and apologised. Of course, he had to apologise, Peter on Twitter. In the House of Commons yesterday, Labour was quick to point out a lack of even-handedness in the government's condemnation. Mr Speaker, the Deputy Prime Minister rushed to the TV studios to condemn the tax avoidance scheme used by Jimmy Carr. Mm. Oddly, he did not take the opportunity co to condemn as morally repugnant the tax avoidance scheme used by Conservative supporter Gary Barlow, who has given a whole new meaning to the phrase, take that. Yeah. <laughs> if he is also morally repugnant, why has he just been given an OBE in the birthday honours? Mr Speaker, why is the Prime Minister's view of what's dodgy in the tax system so partial? Yes. Sir Philip Green has interesting tax arrangements, uh, but far from being labelled morally repugnant in a Mexico TV studio, he's got a government review to head up. <laughs> Mr Speaker, while the Prime Minister talks the talk in TV studios, the reality is that his government is cutting HMRC resources, making it much harder to tackle tax avoidance schemes. And in the botched budget, his government's given every millionaire a legal way to reduce their tax bill by cutting tax for the richest 1%. On tax avoidance, there are a number of measures which we are introducing, which they failed to introduce, a, a general anti-avoidance uh, rule, uh, measures to ensure that at least some uh, tax is paid by those on uh, high incomes. And of course, the Chancellor will be at the dispatch box on Tuesday uh, in a position to answer uh, questions. Well, last night, Jimmy Carr was recording his Channel 4 programme, Eight Out of Ten Cats, which is tonight. Eight out of ten cats pay their taxes, I suppose. Apparently, this Fellow comedians didn't exactly let him off the hook. The writer and satirist Toby Young is with us, as is the Liberal Democrat P. I don't know if he's a satirist as well. Matthew Oakshot, well, he's a Lib Dem, he must be. Good to see you both. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. It's always <laughs> great to be here. Sense, yeah. Don't ask me again. <laughs> oh, he's, he's trying to keep you away is the problem. Um, should satirists be set to a higher standard than other? I mean, Mr Carr had left himself wide open by doing a sketch on one of his shows attacking Barclays Bank for using exactly the kind of tax avoidance schemes that he was using himself. Yeah, he, he, Game, set and match. <laughs> but the difference between um, Gary Barlow and Jimmy Carr is that, OK, they're both guilty of tax avoidance, but Jimmy Carr's also guilty of the sin of hypocrisy. Not only did he come up with that sketch in which he took the mickey out of Barclays for trying to do exactly what he's trying to do, but he also banks at Barclays, it now turns out. Oh, really? Um, yeah. <laughs> but to answer your question, I think... Because you can't really be guilty of tax avoidance if tax avoidance isn't legal. Isn't illegal, I mean. No, I mean... It, 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 no, you can be morally guilty. You can ah, be morally that's guilty, a different, but he didn't say that, he's guilty. Um, I think that satirists are held 
to a higher standard and should be. The point of satire, dating back to, you know, the Greeks, uh, was for the little man to tilt at the oh. titans of the establishment, to make the little man feel better about the fact that he is himself owns very little. You know, it's to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Um, and the trouble is that this kind of, this faux demotic tone that many of these alternative, quirky, left-wing comedians take is very much at odds with their own riches. And it, it turns out that Jimmy Carr isn't a little man at all. He's actually a fully paid up member of the ruling class. He's a plutocrat. Well, he and bought his house in North London for £8.5 million pounds in cash. He Just paid <laughs> cash for it. It was a loan from his company in K2, don't forget. Yeah. Yeah, but it was cash. Uh, I mean, do you think if the, the, is it possible if you are... I mean, take the figure of uh, uh, Armando Iannucci now. He has made a career out of satirising the establishment and now takes an OBE. Does, does that undermine him? I don't know. I, I think I think on... Uh, I, I, think on uh, I see what you mean, actually, about sort of court gestures, isn't it? I think on Jimmy Carr... I mean, his problem is he didn't give 50 quid to the Tories. Then, obviously, Cameron wouldn't have, wouldn't have objected to him. Uh, I mean, there is a difference. Or like Mr there? Brown giving 2.5 million to the Lib Dems. There is a difference, and I don't defend that either. Uh, there is a difference. Um, there is a difference, obviously. The serious point, I think, is there is a difference between morally repugnant uh, and illegal. Uh, and yeah. I think it is right to draw that distinction. Um, but the key point, obviously, for David Cameron as the Prime Minister and George Osborne, who said it was morally repugnant, is what are we actually going to do about it now? Well, How do we make this well, behaviour, which is morally repugnant, legally well, repugnant as well? it's such a well, huge loophole, because there why, is don't a lot of money. why don't you close it? Well, exactly. That's what I'm saying. I'm not in the government. <laughs> we, no, just a minute. Let's just ask, because he's had a good run. You know, a lot of this activity is deeply damaging to the country. We need the money. It's also deeply unfair. It is not technically illegal because the advisers to these people are far, far better right. and more organised than HMRC. Who needs, who needs, and we need to who get needs the money? What, what is all this, what, what the is all this, what is the all this morality stuff? We need stuff. the money for a lot of things. Why is it better for me or anybody else to give money that they have earned, whether it's by telling dirty jokes or, or, any, or any other activity, give money that they have earned to a government which will throw it away on such things as wind farm? subsidies, uh, police who never go out, schools which apparently teach people well, to be more, 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 more ignorant at the end. There's no any tax moral... There's no moral, moral at all. And the whole point about... The whole, the, whole point about tax, the whole point about tax <laughs> avoids... <laughs> honestly, you know, you if, if the police that. of this country... If, if all the police in this country were abducted by aliens tonight, most people wouldn't notice. So the, 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 there, is, there, is, there is... They don't... So what do they do? They don't... Good ones. Run over by a car. Who's going to pay for the schools you send your children to? Who's going to pay for... Actually, as a matter of fact, the whole point about the, the, the schools which are offered to most people is they're so bad they'd be better off keeping them at home. There is no moral there is no moral case against tax avoidance. The whole tax avoidance by definition is legal. And it, it's legal yeah, under, under in a state in a state. So it's not you tell you tell me the point at which it becomes immoral. Exactly. Right. Well what exactly do, do you agree with the point Peter's making? I do agree though and I want to attack it or make the same point from a slightly different angle, which is if there if if there is this important distinction between what you're morally obliged to pay and what you're legally obliged to pay. Uh, the maximum amount you sh you're allowed to pay under the law shouldn't be the ceiling. If you believe in higher taxation, then you're morally obliged to pay more tax than you're legally allowed to under the current system. So if you think that the highest rate of tax should actually be higher, I don't know whether you do or he not. He does. You do. Yeah, then yeah. you should actually donate money yeah. to HMRC yeah. in addition to now the maximum amount you're legally idea, allowed to pay. That is an idea, but totally unrealistic. I mean, I well, am you're equally well, morally I'll tell you repugnant. What. Well, if you you've don't... quite an innings. Let me just tell you, I am happy to pay more tax, and I would like to pay more tax, but I don't then just want to make can. it as a donation. Well, let me tell you, because I also want... Well, my individually won't, uh, paying more even than, the you know, putting rates up, but only if that is part of everybody having this to. It's not you and want to pay more tax, is, you want me to pay more tax. I want everybody to pay more tax. You want everybody tax. to pay more tax. So so to do it, but it's, I also it's, want it's, it to be fair. To the We're drifting, to the law, we are to drifting right off the main point here, they which don't, is... You won't. No one can say exactly don't, where the line is between morally repugnant and not, but if if the Chancellor and the, and the camera... Well, but there's some things that are clearly the wrong side of the line, well the wrong side of the line, and what Jimmy Carr did is well the wrong side of the line, as many other people who... David Cameron is not prepared to condemn very selective condemnation. That's what we've got to do. I mean, so the, most, the, right, it's, the it's biggest a, scandal of all Mary, is non-dom status, all right. which is a total yeah. outrage, okay. yeah. and we should uh, get on and do Mary, it. Mary Ann. Thank you. Hmm. I, I want to ask Toby, do you have any objections to Jimmy Carr paying only 1% tax? 
No, I think that uh, no one is morally obliged okay. to pay more than so, they're legally required so to pay. So if you have no objections, who is going to fight? You, you um, admirably run a new free school. Who is going to fund that? Funded fee, by the state. Fee, funded by the state. I think Who is going to pay for that school tax. if we all pay How one you cent tax? I don't think that he is morally at fault. I think you have to simplify the tax code, which is what the Chancellor tried to do uh, in his last budget. I don't uh, think that failed. everyone... And failed. I don't think yeah. that the, the effective tax rate think, for everyone should be one cent. I think it's anti-social to pay one cent You need to simplify the tax code, close some of the loopholes. I think a flat tax is probably so the best way, way to, to make sure that people tax, like Jimmy Carr it? can't yeah. have, have you never tax, used tax. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hmm. Have you never used a tax avoidance scheme? No. Never? No. You don't even put money into an ISA? No, I do invest in my pension, but that is not yeah. using so a tax avoidance what about shopping scheme. That's not using tax avoidance. No, that is not. That is available to everybody. You've been no. a, oh, so is this available to everybody? No, it's not you're available. This is not available you're to everybody. Fund. Fund. This is only available to people Excuse who have very expensive advisors. You can only put money into an ISA if you've got the savings in the first place, and many people watching this programme have no savings. No, there's an important difference You're a fund manager. Have you never advised your clients to go into tax avoidance no, schemes? absolutely Never. not. I don't, no. I advise pension Never. funds and charities who are tax-free anyway, actually. But, look, it is an important point. I pay my pension fund contributions. I've stopped now because I'm 65. But I get exactly the same tax breaks as everybody else does. This is different because this is a secret scheme until exposed by the Times, which most people didn't know about and is very wait, 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 expensive. Wait, 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 so there's a big difference. People who yeah. can't afford to pay into a pension, as you can, can't take advantage of the, of the, no, of the, the, of the legal of course, tax avoidance, which you quite justifiably take. You get, deduction, you get, deduction, not, you get deduction of the highest, highest rate. rate. No, you're being... This is not right. One rate for the rich, one for the poor. Which we're against. Well, that is also we're wanting to change. But, you know, there is a big difference between these secret aggressive schemes and something which is public and open uh, to everybody. Don't like that's tax. how it don't works. Like I mean, tax. it is an element of degree. I mean, doing some things to mitigate your tax is one thing. Being a multimillionaire and only paying 1% of your income in tax is surely wrong. Yeah. Surely, if you don't I mean, like... If you don't like... Tax, there's, 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 matter. It's a moralist, Peter. I find it really odd that you don't see anything wrong in paying 1% tax. He's in these artificial schemes just to dodge tax. Surely scale is an issue. If I, if I were legally able to pay, to pay as little tax as that, I'd, and I challenge anyone around the sale sincerely to say that they, they feel differently. If you were legally able to pay as little tax as Jimmy Carr paid, you'd take the opportunity. I I, would, I, the I, know, opportunity. I challenge I'd Wait until, you, wait until, wait until the opportunity not. comes your I way. Could, I, could I could do that, that and I don't. Yeah. I could do that and I don't. I could buy one of these schemes and I don't. I choose okay. not to because I think it's grossly wrong All right. and it should be illegal. Stick You're with this, really we're going to move on. It's the end of another week here at Westminster, even though they're still driveling on for Britain. But with David Cameron in Mexico, Nick Clegg in Brazil, no one's been too sure who's actually running the country. This is what they've missed, because this is the week in 60 seconds. No, being a world leader isn't easy, especially when you've got to go to G20 summits in sunny Mexico. To be fair, Greece turned the head honchos pale, and Spain, Egypt and Syria didn't exactly give them a rosy glow either. Also down Mexico way, David Cameron failed to see eye to eye with the Argentinian president, Christina Kirchner. She tried to give him a letter saying, I'm guessing, can we have the Falklands, please? He refused to play ball. O-levels could be on the way back. Michael Gove thinks they'll help turn English kids into academic world beaters. Some of his Lib Dem coalition mates, not happy. Simon Hughes. Talking of which, Simon Hughes may be in hot water next time he sees Nick Clegg, his boss, and listen carefully, Simon. Deputy Prime Minister. Can the Deputy, uh, can, can the uh, Foreign Secretary make clear? I won't mention to the Deputy Prime Minister his slip. Uh, <laughs> just... No, but it's entirely between ourselves uh, <laughs> in these four walls. And all of us. But we won't tell, will we? Interesting week for Michael Gove, uh, of course, starting out the week upsetting uh, Justice Leveson and ending up by upsetting Nick Clegg in the jungle by the idea of bringing back something akin to O-levels and, of course, another kind of exam that would go with them. It used to be called CSEs. Toby and Matthew, of course, are still here. They've not come to blows yet, but I'll see if I can change that in a minute. Uh, I suspect you like the idea of more rigorous exams. I like the idea of more rigorous exams, but I think that what Michael Gove is up to is something completely different. This is a process which began, very interestingly, last week with the vote on Jeremy Hunt. This is the separation of the Liberal Democrat and Conservative parties, which will eventually become an actual split. Mm -hmm. uh, and it will, there'll be a lot of posturing by both parties. And this is posturing by the Tory party, pretending to its, its more conservative supporters that it's really conservative. This proposal has no hope whatever 
of, of becoming a, a real practical, okay, let me ask practical it, fact uh, in education. Matthew, is that, is that true? Well, the Lib Dems say they weren't told about it. Mind you, we understand the Prime Minister wasn't told about it either, so Mr Clegg shouldn't feel too out of joint. Putting aside the coalition politics, I want to actually stick on the issue at the moment. Would it be good or bad to have more robust exams in our schools? Um, I think I wouldn't mind just commenting on that because I agree with him. This is, all, this is all about Tories differentiating. And basically, as with Leveson, this is about Michael Gove starting off his leadership campaign with the Tory party several years earlier. We should We've be aware of that. For so long. And I, I would actually... I, I take with a pinch of salt that uh, David Cameron didn't know anything about it. David Cameron and Michael... Okay, will the Lib Dems uh, uh, attempt to stop this happening? We will stop it happening. It's not in the coalition agreement. It's, there's no point to it. It's a, it's a political stunt. It's, uh, Why are you, you know, the last it? thing Because the last thing we want is a major reorganisation of the education system. The NHS one was a nightmare enough, and it's not necessary. What we have already... I was just talking to a mother before I came in today, and she said, what's all this about? My children are already taking something called the IGCSE. There is already available in schools. So we have a two-tier system already. Well, it's a two-tier system, Isn't but it's it? there. We don't need a great okay. reorganisation. So the you run a free school, what would so, you like? You know, it's not necessary. I, I, I think this is great. Um, I think all children should be held to a higher standard, and at our school, we would we would hope all the children will sit O levels um, uh, if if the change goes through. I mean, I think Nick Clegg completely overreacted. I don't see why he's decided to make this a test of strength uh, within the coalition. One of the ways he, he said. I knew, no, I knew absolutely nothing about this. I've been com kept completely in the dark, but I'm against it. It's like, I mean, it was almost confessing that it was a knee-jerk reaction. And when he condemned it, he didn't condemn it for the reason you've said, that it would involve too much reorganisation, like the reorganisation of the NHS. He said, this is a policy for the few, not the many, because only a few children will be able to take oh, O-levels. Sure. But no, actually, the proposal is that the vast majority of children should be able to take O-levels, as they do in Singapore. In Singapore, 80% of children take O-levels. Why, why should our children not be as intellectually able as the children in Singapore. We, we have to compete against Singapore and mm -hmm. we often hear education secretaries complain that there are schools that are coasting. I think our entire school system is coasting and its standards need to rise and the rigour, I mean it's very important that we introduce more rigour into our public examinations because we are competing against Singapore and China and Japan and bright children are really not challenged enough at the moment and you know our, our education system is biased very much towards the middle so it's, but it's really aimed at children who are who are being lifted from a D grade to a C grade at GCSEs, but it doesn't help the ones you know who ought to be getting A's and A stars, but, but and they're the ones that we need in order to compete with the rest of the, o o levels the rest of the o world. O o system o is not the way to do it. O levels were designed for a selective state secondary education system, and that they were introduced in 1951 with that very much in mind. And the reason they had to go uh, was because the comprehensive system, which was introduced by Labour with Tory support, made it impossible to sustain those levels of education generally. And the GCSE was introduced to blur the fact that standards had, had, had been reduced. Unless you address that, and Michael Gove has neither the power nor the intention of addressing it, and it's still illegal to open a new grammar school in this country, it's all posture. And the point, right. Toby, about what Nick Clegg said was, if Michael Gove was serious about actually doing this and getting it through the government and getting his government policy, you don't suddenly do a leak in the well, Daily Mail. No, the way there's no evidence that Michael Gove actually leaked it himself. No. Or, or well, I think he did lunch with Simon Heffer what, and told him. What, 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 do you well, actually you know are. that, Andrew, listen, by the way? But yeah. listen, but the point is, and this is how That's we do told. it in a coalition government, if you actually want a policy to happen, you discuss it properly uh, uh, and, and you get by need legislation this for this, is just so a, how will you stop it? He doesn't does it? need legislation for this, well, how do you stop it? doesn't he? Who knows? I mean, any, any major well, change doesn't. any major change has to be agreed by the Cabinet, whether it needs legislation or not. Uh, so it ain't going to okay, happen. OK, we're going to have to go because I've got to give you, before we go, the answer to our quiz. The question was, over what crime is the European Commission taking Britain to court? The answer, of course, is... Garlic. Garlic, is it? Yeah, it leaves a bad taste in the mouth. Oh... Boom, you can boom. do better than that, that Andrew. <laughs> I just go to the level of my guess. Uh, uh, so just just remind me, just remind me how you stop this. What the garlic? No, the stop the uh, <laughs> stop the change in the exam system if it doesn't need a bill. The education department can, will always oblige. The education uh, excuse me, no, no, cab no cabinet minister can go off on his own bat and do something highly politically sensitive. If so, the Lib Dem ministers will be doing lots of so things. I mean, he, did, he hasn't prepared like the ground, did he? He hasn't like prepared that. the ground. It doesn't work like that. It's a coalition government. The, the problem me. with trying to arrange these things uh, behind closed okay. doors before public We, to we thank anywhere. all of our guests uh, on the programme today. The One O'Clock News is signing over on B.